natural selection. Now Darwin had also collected lot of information when he had gone on a five year trip around the world on the ship HMS Beagle. Now when he returned to England, he had started writing all those observations in great detail and he was had he was able to formulate the theory as well but he was not able to publish it for the simple reason because his wife was a catholic and theory of natural selection or evolution in general would be against her religious beliefs and also the religious belief of so many other people. So he was just procrastinating and sitting with his theory and he was breeding pigeons. Yes, he was breeding pigeons. So he was carrying out artificial selection and he was able to collect number of breeds of pigeons which he interbred to produce even new varieties and that is why these pigeons have also been called Darwin's pigeons. So there are number of them as you can see fan tailed pigeon, there is a Jacobin, there is a powder pigeon and so many more and here in the last one you can see even there are a lot of feathers at the feet. So these are some of the various varieties of pigeons and it was when Wallace independently had also come to the concept of natural selection and he sent his paper to be published to England. So the common friends of both of them that is Charles Lyell who was a geologist and another one Dr. Hooker who was a botanist, they were knowing about Darwin's theory and when they read Wallace's work then they advised them to publish the paper collectively and that is how this theory actually was then published and everybody came to know of it and today it is one of the most important concept regarding the mechanism of evolution. Now before we go into the more details of the theory, let us first discuss a few questions. So here the concept that population tends to increase geometrically while food supply increases arithmetically was put forward by. Now we have just now mentioned that this was from essay on population by Thomas Malthus. So here our correct answer is option 1. So let us move on to Darwinism. Now let us get into the nitty gritties of Darwinism. So here first of all the entire concept is being arrived by deductive reasoning and this entire theory of evolution by natural selection is given as three facts and two deductions. So starting with this over prodigality which literally means over production. So all organisms tend to increase in geometric proportion or geometric progression as we have come to know through the essay on population by Malthus. Now this is a fact that all organisms over reproduce and here Darwin has given number of examples like an oyster produces nearly 60 million eggs in its lifetime. The slowest breeder that is elephant, it gets sexually matured at the age of 30 years and if we start from just one pair of elephants, so in their lifetime they would produce at the maximum only 6 offspring and they interbreed and ultimately Darwin has calculated that 
in 750 years there would be 19 million elephants. So these are just few examples from which we see that every organism has immense capacity to reproduce. And this is of course according to the Malthus concept about human population as well. Now moving on to the next part that in spite of this overproduction still there is constancy of population. The populations tend to remain constant even though there is over reproduction. Now this is another fact. So from these two important facts the deduction we arrive to. So the deduction here is that the resources are limited leading to struggle for existence. And why is this a struggle occurring? This is competition for food, space and mate. And this is occurring at three levels. That is intraspecific. Intraspecific would be within the same species. So the members of the same species have the same requirement. They are competing for the same type of food, the same type of habitat where they want to live and similar mating partners. So this way, this struggle is very severe. And here Darwin has given examples of prawn. Now, in aquaculture, these prawns are bred in ponds. And what happens that when the water in the pond becomes too overcrowded by these prawns, they start eating each other. That means they turn cannibals. Although in nature, prawns are not cannibals. So these farmers, they know about it. So what happens when the eggs hatch and the larvae start growing, they grow bigger and the pond is getting overcrowded, they start transferring them to other ponds so that there is no overcrowding and before those prawns get ready to be served in the platter, they would not have eaten each other. Another is interspecific struggle. Interspecific would be among members of different species. Now through the food chain, we know that each organism in the food chain is the food of the other. Like in a forest, a deer and a tiger, both are running fast. And one has to run faster than the other. Because if the deer runs faster, the tiger would have to sleep without dinner. And if the tiger runs faster, the deer would lose its life. So there is a constant struggle between the two. And at the same time, there are abiotic factors that is outside the species. So that is extra specific struggle. That is environment. Now environment is not always suitable, not always favorable for the organisms. So they have to compete with that environment also to survive. Now, after this deduction, we move on to the next fact. Now, this again is a fact that in nature, no two organisms are exactly alike. Even the siblings who are born from the same parent, even they have some variations. So, except for identical twins, no two organisms are exactly alike. And according to Darwin, these variations are small, they are continuous, that means there would be slight change from one member of the species to the other, like if we talk about color, so there is gradation going from light to dark or from dark to light and it is directional that is going in one direction towards darker or towards lighter, towards heavier or towards light, uh, being less in body size, so on. So this is another important fact. So the final deduction, the deduction number two. So this deduction is that since there is struggle for existence and since all organisms are not alike, more of those with favorable variations. So that means the organisms which have variations which allow them to succeed in these competitions, in these struggles, they would survive and 
दोज हु वुड सर्वाइव विल प्रोड्यूस मोर नंबर ऑफ ऑफ स्प्रिंग सो दैट देयर रिप्रेजेंटेशन इन दॉपुलेशन इंक्रीजेस एंड दैट्स वॉट इज द सर्वाइवल ऑफ द फिटेस्ट और विच इज नेचुरल सिलेक्शन दैट मीन्स इन दैट पर्टिकुलर एनवायरमेंटल कंडीशन दे आर द फिटेस्ट so this entire darwin's theory we can summarize it in short that is reproductive ability of the population to increase in number that is in geometric progression but at the same time there are limited resources so the carrying capacity of the environment is less and that puts a constraint on the increasing population so as a result what happens that the population remains constant because of a struggle for existence and while these struggles are going on some of the organisms are better adapted some are not that means there are hereditary variations there in the nature and so this leads to natural selection that is of course the survival of the fittest although this term survival of the fittest was not used by darwin darwin had only used the term natural selection this term later was added to darwin's theory by another naturalist herbert spencer and it was also mentioned in the later editions of his book but that was not darwin's work and because of this there would be adaptation of these organisms to the changing environment and this is what leads to evolution of new species so from pre existing species new species develop origin of new species is occurring due to the various heritable changes which allow them to succeed successfully in all the various competitions and they will reproduce to pass on those same characteristics to their offspring leading to formation of new species right so this is about the darwin's concept and now for every theory there are certain points which go in favor while some go in disfavor so let us analyze darwin's theory and its various pros and cons now taking on the various merits and demerits of darwinism so the most important point in darwin's theory is certainly natural selection so natural selection is a kind of filter or you can say that the various alleles for a particular trait which are present in the members of the population out of that certain traits provide them adaptability while some of them are making them weaker now natural selection is filtering out the most favorable traits and allowing those individuals to multiply and increase their number so that is in the simplest language if we define natural selection it is differential reproduction that is it is providing differential success in reproduction to those individuals who have the favorable traits to adapt themselves to the particular environmental conditions and natural selection acts on the individuals and on the individuals phenotype so phenotype is external characteristics of course the phenotype is determined by the genotype that is the genetic makeup of the organism but every genotype is not expressed in the phenotype so here we get two important aspects one is differential reproduction of genotypes and the other is that natural selection acts on organisms phenotype now this natural selection according to darwin is the only mechanism for evolution to occur and 
by natural selection we can explain number of concepts like mimicry relationship between flowers and insects now here there is one very good example we have that is given by darwin himself when he was on his trip on hms beagle he had visited madagascar also and in madagascar he found this orchid where this flower has a very long corolla tube so corolla tube is formed when the petals of the flowers are joined and there would be a long tube like structure formed and usually at the base of that tube the nectaries are present so by looking at this flower which has a corolla tube of almost 10 inches darwin predicted that here there must be an insect whose proboscis matches this length darwin was not able to find it but 21 years after his death a giant hawk moth was discovered in that area and whose proboscis exactly matches the length of the corolla tube and here is that giant hawk moth so this is a classic case where by looking at one particular species of the flower darwin was able to predict about the availability of a pollinating insect also in that area and this is a exemplary example in favor of natural selection now another very important examples are mimicry now mimicry as a term i think every student knows because they have been copying their teachers their relatives friends so here in nature also mimicry is going on now if you see these two butterflies they resemble each other however out of this one is the monarch butterfly this one is monarch the other one is viceroy now monarch is very distasty so the birds and other predators they don't like to feed on it because it has a very bitter taste but this viceroy is not so it is palatable but for any bird it is difficult to identify viceroy from the monarch when both of them are found together in the same area the birds they are not lepidopterous that they can identify one from the other and this protects the viceroy the viceroy is able to survive from the predator this type of mimicry this was described by henry walter bates and after him it is called batesian mimicry so it is a kind of mimicry where a palatable species here that is viceroy is mimicking a unpalatable species or we can in other words say one is noxious the other is not or one is dangerous the other is not so on and in this case out of the two the one which is copying will be called the mimic and the one which is being copied is the model now there is another kind of mimicry as you see three insects over here they are also resembling each other but these are three different species these are one is bee the honey bee the other is wasp and one is hornet so if you see their coloration it is quite bright with yellow colored bands on them and all three of them are distasty so birds do not like to feed on them but this is a kind of group mimicry where even if one of the insect has been once a food for the bird the bird will know that the others are equally distasty because they are looking similar and that's why they should not be predated upon now this kind of mimicry is called millerian mimicry and here there is a resemblance between unrelated species which are noxious or dangerous and they are exhibiting similar kind of warning systems such as the same pattern of colors over here and this way all three of them are protected from the predator birds now when we talk about mimicry how can we leave out camouflage now camouflage and mimicry they resemble 
with each other but at the same time these are two separate terms now mimicry as we have just seen in our examples that one species is resembling the other that is mimicry but when one species resembles with its surroundings so that it is blending with it and it cannot be easily recognized then it is called camouflage let us take two examples now here we can see two arthropods here this one is green over the green leaf so it is easily blending with its surrounding while here this is brown and it is in contrast with the green color so it is easily seen by the birds when they fly nearby so which one is better protected of course which is showing camouflage so camouflage is basically cryptic coloration for defending or protecting oneself from the predators or the other way round out so it could be that the organism here itself is a predator but since it has blended with the surrounding the prey will come near it without getting any warning and then it can be quickly predated upon now when we talk about organisms which are able to protect themselves from their predator in a particular surrounding from this we can move on to the word fitness which is the central idea to the darwin's theory of natural selection now fitness is something which is the end result of the ability to adapt and then of course natural get naturally and this fitness is reproductive fitness according to darwin it is reproductive fitness because the goal of all organisms is to live long enough and pass on their gene pool to the next generation so according to darwin the fittest is not somebody who is taller sharper stronger but the one who is able to survive in those competitive situations and reproduce large number of offspring to carry on its gene pool so in other words we can just say that individuals that can locate harvest and utilize the resources which are of course in limitation and they minimize the influence of the limiting factors acting upon them and they would be most successful in continuing their genes to the next generation so as we said here the concept of fitness is basically the maximum adaptive value an organism an individual has so that it survives and reproduces and that's how we understand the term survival of the fittest so out of the same type of a species different individuals have different variations in which some of the variations will be increasing fitness while others will not like here we have seen the cryptic coloration is increasing the fitness of the organism while the coloration which is not helping the animal that is certainly decreasing its fitness now other than natural selection one very important key point of darwin's theory is branching descent now earlier greek philosophers thought about evolution in the form of a ladder even aristotle thought so so according to them that all the organisms even the inanimate matter can be arranged from simple to complex just like the rungs of the ladder that is the inanimate matter is the at the lower most rung then the smaller animals like insects mollusks they would be here and at the top most of course the humans so this is how the organisms were arranged according to the greek philosophers but darwin gave the concept of branching descent that there has been a common ancestry and from that there has been tree like pattern where different organisms have diversified according to their fitness and getting selected by nature so this is what is another very very important concept given by darwin now before going any further we'll take a few questions resemblance of one organism to another for protection and hiding is now here again you see both the choices are there mimicry as well as camouflage but 
here we are talking about one organism resembling the other so that means our answer should be mimicry right so that is answer one now next one what is meant by the term darwin's fitness physical strength the strongest no the healthiest no most aggressive no it is the ability to survive and reproduce so this would be the correct answer that is option 1 now in spite of such important mechanism that is natural selection given by darwin still his theory has certain drawbacks so we'll move on to those discussion and then we'll take up mutation theory now let us conclude darwinism with its drawbacks and then we'll take up the mutation theory or mutationism now first of all the drawbacks of darwinism now the major drawback that was that darwin couldn't explain the mode of origin and transmission of variations so darwin did talk about variations and according to him the variations were small continuous and directional but what was the origin of those variations and hence how were those variations inherited by the future generations there was no explanation for it and according to darwin evolution is a progressive series of adaptive changes brought by natural selection so if it is always progressive then how come some of these structures or organs in the body have become vestigial that means there was loss of characters also happening during evolution for which darwin had no explanation and as he said the raw material for selection is genetic variation among individuals within a species right so that leads to selection of the fittest but there is no explanation for arrival of the fittest so how do these variations arise that's the big question mark and as we said natural selection chooses the best suited alleles but where do these alleles come from and last but not the least of course while darwin had formulated his theory during that same time mendel had also talked about inheritable factors at that time of course the term genes was not introduced it was just factors according to mendel and those factors influence the phenotype but darwin either ignored these observations or kept silent or we can also say that at that time nobody was able to understand mendel so maybe darwin also never understood what mendel was trying to say so even though darwin's theory has these drawbacks in which the main drawback of course is the lack of explanation regarding variations but still natural selection and branching descent are very important concepts of darwinism the explanation regarding variations led darwin to formulate another theory and that was theory of pangenesis or simply pangenesis so he formulated or proposed this theory as a developmental theory of heredity and this was written in his book on variations in plants and animals under domestication this is another book by darwin and darwin in total had written almost 14 books so in this he suggested that all cells in an organism are capable of shedding some minute particles which he called gemmules so from all the cells from all the body organs these tiny gemmules are being shed and these gemmules along with the circulation they reach to the gonads 
and get collected over there and from there they are transmitted to the next generation via the sperms and the ova so this is darwin's way of explanation but of course as we know it was the time when genetics was not yet an accomplished discipline and nobody was clearly knowing how actually heredity occurs so this is how darwin tried to explain it and now he returned to lemark what lemark has said use and disuse produces acquired changes which are passed on to the next generation so darwin is relying on that and he said that the cells of the parent undergo changes as a result of environmental change and they will consequently transmit those modified gemmules because if in the organ or the structure there is a change even the gemmule produced from it will also show that change and that will be passed on to the next generation so here he was trying to find out a physical basis how the acquired traits are inherited so this problem of origin and transmission of variation remained it was later answered by another theory that was mutationism given by hugo de vries now hugo de vries was one of the rediscoverer of mendelism and he gave this theory mutation theory in which he found the source of variation so the drawback which was left or the gap which was left in the darwin's theory that was answered by mutation theory and this was published in his book species and varieties their origin through mutation now hugo de vries was a dutch botanist he experimented on a plant enothera lamarckiana or commonly called evening primrose and he carried out number of experiments on it just like mendel had experimented on pisum sativum that is the pea plant and this plant also showed lots of characteristic different traits like some were tall some were short the position of the flowers so on these were there and he carried out number of selfing experiments in them and what he found was that in the filial generation that is daughter generation there was both progressive and retrogressive variations progressive would be where there was a trait which was in addition to the parental trait the parent was not having that trait but it appeared in the daughter generation and retrogressive where there was a loss of a trait also so that means it is not only one single direction not only progressive but there can be loss of traits as well and so this explains that few species arise not gradually as darwin has opinionated but rather suddenly due to discontinuous variations so now according to de vries the variations are discontinuous they are large and they can be non directional that means either they could be progressive or they could be retrogressive or regressive whichever way we say it and so various biologists later they extended these views to propose that new species can arise in only one or few mutation so there can be a single step large mutation also occurring leading to macro evolutionary changes and that's what is called saltation the term saltation itself means jumping so that means there is a abrupt change and that is what we see in macro evolution because if evolution was so gradual then certainly in our fossil record we should have found number of transitional species in between but that is not so so that means there have been these large scale changes which have occurred in the nature from time to time and that's what is called saltation so with this mutation theory or mutationism we have found that the ultimate source of variations are mutations and this is totally opposite to darwin's concept of continuous variation which were small and directional right 
So, even though we have got the source of variation, but still there are certain flaws, certain drawbacks to mutation theory also. So, taking up some of these drawbacks, the first and the foremost that the plant on which De Vries experimented, that is Enothera Lamarckiana, it was a hybrid and with chromosomal aberrations. So, the results were never the same. You must have studied in genetics that. Mendelian ratios are constant whenever the same experiment is conducted. But with De Vries experiment, the results were never same because this plant was not a true breeding plant. So anyway, but he got the source of variation even though he experimented on the wrong specimen. Then mutations are not so common as he was able to see with every generation and mostly they are recessive. So, if the mutation is recessive, then it is not ex being expressed and as a result, if it is not expressed, it is not exposed to the environmental conditions and it will not have an effect on evolution. And many a times, if it is a highly retrogressive mutation, it is lethal. That means, that particular organism either during embryonic development or in early phase of development would die as a result that mutation will be lost from the population. And sometimes the mutations get reversed. One of the best example we have that is Ancon sheep. Now this Ancon sheep was a short legged sheep. So it, the size of the legs was shorter than what the normal sheep have. Now, this was born at a farm in a place in USA and the farmer thought if all his sheep are short-legged, that would be very useful. Why? Because they won't be able to jump out of the fence. So, that was a, a desired trait according to the farmer. And this Ancon sheep, the first one which was born, it was a male ram actually. And he bred it with normal sheep and the first generation he got that of a short legged sheep. But in the next generation all were normal legged. Shows that in the eukaryotic cells there is a very good proofreading mechanisms and sometimes if a mutation does creep in that would be corrected. And since this mutation is no longer there we have no other example of Ancon sheep. So that means it did not affect the origin of new species from it. So, we do not have any species of Ancon sheep. And of course, whatever Darwin's theory could explain, that cannot be explained by mutationism. So, this cannot explain mimicry, mutual dependence of flowers and pollinating insects because after all, De Vries was totally a geneticist. He was working in the lab conditions while Darwin was a naturalist. And that is why De Vries never understood the importance of nature that is environmental conditions having their impact on evolution. So, this results to the wide gap between the mutationist and the selectionist. So, now there were two schools of thought developed for continuous or discontinuous variation. The gap between mutationist and selectionist finally started to close with the development of population genetics that is the property of genes in populations and they began to formulate comprehensive theory of how alleles behave in a population and the way in which the changes in the gene frequencies lead to evolutionary change and that is how the entire new theory that would be the last one that we study but that would be in the next video. And finally, we can conclude with few questions. The idea of mutations was brought forth by, so here Charles Darwin who observed a wide variety of organisms during sea voyage, Hardy and Wienberg who worked on allele frequencies in a population, Gregor Mendel who worked on Pisum sativum and last one that is Hugo de Vries, this is our correct answer who worked on evening primrose. So here our answer is option 1. Another one, Darwin's theory of pangenesis shows similarity with theory of inheritance of acquired characters 
then what shall be the correct according to it? Useful organs become strong and developed while useless organs become extinct. Size of organs increase with aging. Development of organs is due to willpower. There should be some physical basis of inheritance. That is, of course, the gemules being formed. So, this is how the theory of pangenesis explains Darwin's variations and their transmission to the next generation. So, here our answer is the important theories that we have studied today, Lamarckism, Darwinism and Mutationism. In both of the last theories, we have seen that there are important points, but at the same time there are drawbacks. So, we can say that neither Darwinism can explain evolution completely nor can mutation explain evolution completely. So, that is why both of these concepts were joined and that would be our next theory of discussion that is synthetic theory. So, by the time stay tuned for the next video. That is all for now. Have a nice day.